Good morning, everybody. So I'm here with you today, obviously, to talk about GDPR compliance, what it is, and how it affects you. Um, it's not the most fun topic, but I'm going to try to make it interesting for you guys. So I wanted to begin today with a little bit of an introduction about myself. Um, I'm the CEO of Host Tuplex. Um, I've been in the hosting industry for about 20 years. Um, I started my first hosting company when I was about 13 and a few more along the way. We are a managed WordPress hosting provider. Um, I am also the chief information officer at Mandala. It's a cryptocurrency exchange. I primarily oversee all the security operations, the audits, um, and defending and thwarting off any cybersecurity attacks. Um, I am also very passionate about data privacy, obviously, with why I'm here with you today and educating clients on security. I'm a huge college football fan, especially in the Big Ten. Um, I went to the University of Iowa and uh, a big WordCamp enthusiast. I wanted to preface this uh, session with you today by saying that I'm not a lawyer. Uh, my guidance or advice is only to allow you to become more familiar with GDPR and help you understand the concepts that are behind it. However, for the most detailed rules and regulations, I highly uh, recommend seeking the advice of counsel. Now, I want to begin today by sharing a quote that comes straight from the official EU GDPR website. And that says that GDPR represents the biggest shakeup of data protection in over 20 years. Now, you may ask, you know, what does GDPR even stand for? So GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. And its primary objective is to give citizens back control over their data. Now, believe it or not, you're actually under surveillance right now. Your cell phone that's in your pocket is tracking your every move. The apps that are on your phone know where you are. Your supermarket loyalty card knows, lets companies know about your age, your sex, your purchase habits. They can even estimate your beard length and they know your favorite items before you realize they're your favorite items. And GDPR aims to address these issues or at least make you aware of them. Now, while this is an EU law affecting EU citizens, my hope is that other countries adopt similar laws, um, perhaps ones that are a little bit more refined. Now, how many of you have heard of MoviePass? Good, most of you. So for those of you that don't know, uh, MoviePass is a, a movie subscription service. Um, I think you can see X number of movies per month. I feel like it's constantly changing um, for $10 a month. And um, anyways, the, the CEO of MoviePass was recently um, giving a lecture, speaking uh, in front of a Hollywood audience. And this was maybe earlier this summer. And he was essentially back bragging about their data collection practices. And he was saying that they were tracking users three hours before and after they had left the movie theater. And, you know, companies like MoviePass, you know, they're, they're taking our data. They're creating a data profile of us and they're tracking us. And the problem was that the MoviePass CEO, you know, he didn't dis explicitly disclose to his customers that they were tracking us, or at least not until he was in front of that Hollywood audience. And this is where a law such as GDPR would come in. It allows for transparency. It requires that explicit consent. Um, and, uh, you know, now I want you to imagine what would happen if this data would get into the wrong hands. How many of you have heard of Ashley Madison? Good, most of you as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Ashley Madison is an online dating service that offers an apparent escape from the banalities of marriage. It's marketed primarily towards married individuals and their company motto is, you know, life's short, have an affair. So, so about two summers ago, um, Ashley Madison was informed by a group of hackers known as the Impact Team that they had their company or member user data. And uh, the impact team essentially said, you know, if you don't take down your website, we're going to release all your users' data. And I think they, they gave them about 30 days to comply. And the CEO decided, you know, not to. He didn't believe them or for whatever reason, he, you know, he didn't take down their website. And lo and behold, two months go by and they released the data of 36 million users. Now, immediately after the attack, social networks and the media were overloaded with these pejorative overtones, which mostly came from the unfaithful users of the website, which we happen to know now were mostly men. 
and who are also all of a sudden these data privacy activists. <laughs> And on the other hand, a lot of people consider them, these hackers, to be these benevolent donors to society. And at the end of the day, you know, this one data leak upended the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And my takeaway here is that these examples don't apply to sites just like Ashley Madison. It applies to your profile on Facebook, your purchase habits at your grocery store, at hospitals, at credit bureaus, at banks. And my point is that privacy and data privacy should be a fundamental right that we as individuals have. A recent study in the EU showed that three out of four EU citizens don't feel in control of their data. And in fact, 90% of the EU is concerned about data collection without their consent and which contributed to uh, not shopping online. 35% uh, payment security concerns, 28% trust concerns, and 29% privacy concerns. And with all these ubiquitous data breaches that are occurring every day, uh, this really begs the question, you know, how are we going to grow an economy if we don't have trust? And continuing on the objectives of GDPR, its goal is to strengthen the individual rights when it comes to data privacy and to unify data protections and facilitate the flow of personal data. Now, a little history about GDPR. Uh, it was initially proposed back in January of 2012. Uh, the regulation went into effect in May of 2016, and it was just enforced a few months back in May of 2018. Now, there are some really, really steep fines for those are, that are non-compliant. It's 20 million euros, or 4% of your annual revenue, whichever is greater. The law itself is really quite long and vague. It's 260 pages, 99 sections, and well, I definitely wouldn't say it's the perfect law by any means. In my opinion, I think it's at least a step in the right direction. Now, a lot of people are concerned about how this affects WordPress, and they think it may be affecting WordPress only, but um, in fact, it's CMS agnostic. This applies to everything, to every platform there is out there, Shopify, uh, you know, whatever. So please don't run away from WordPress just because of, you know, GDPR. Um, so you might say, Sam, you keep saying, you know, EU, 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 you know, what does this have to do with us, right? Well, the EU is taking the lead on data privacy. And in fact, they are able to assert this um, over us using something called long arm jurisdiction or extraterritoriality. And this is where a local court can assert jurisdiction over someone in another state, or in this case, from the EU to other countries um, who process the personal data of EU citizens. And so essentially, it really applies everywhere to anyone who is processing the data of any EU citizen. Now you may say, you know, Sam, I don't have any EU clients. You know, why does this matter? Well, you may be collecting EU user data and may not even know it, and they don't have to be your client. This can come by way of a contact form, a mailing lists, comments on your website, if somebody's inserting their email address in there, uh, through live chat means, obviously if they're a direct client, and other CMS and integration systems that you have built in into your website. Now what counts as personal data? Uh, that could be things such as your name, your address, obviously your social security number or national identity number, um, any type of genetic information. Uh, <clears throat> that also includes your race, your ethnic origin, any other health data your geolocation data, your IP address data, any, any type of identifier that can be tracked back to you um, counts as personal data. Now I wanted to review the eight data subject rights. These are uh, the rights that are included in GDPR. The first one is the right to access. Uh, this law states, or this right states that we must provide access to an EU citizen's personal data. It's really similar to how you would go and obtain your own credit report. And it states that no fees should be requested uh, or, uh, when you are exercising this right. And when somebody does request this right, uh, you have 30 days to comply. Next is the right to be informed, uh, which states that individuals have the right to be informed about the collection and the use of their data. It is really the, the what, the why, and the how. You know, what are you storing, why are you storing it, and how are you storing it? And this right also states that you must provide um, an individual with clear and concise information about what you are doing with their data. Um, all the information you apply to them should be easily accessible, 
it must be easy to understand, it must be intelligible, and it must be free of charge. The next one is a really important one. It's explicit consent. Uh, this means that there can be no room for misinterpretation. Everything must be done with clear and affirmative action and essentially nullifies implied consent or opt-out consent. And in your sign-up forms, your newsletter forms, order forms, you can no longer pre-check that box that says, you know, please add me to your mailing list. Uh, the user themselves have to check that box on their own. They must explicitly consent to doing that. And it also, the, the right also specifies, it must be as easy as it is to withdraw as it is to give consent. So you must have those uh, mechanisms in place. <clears throat> Next is the, the right to rectification. And this is essentially just um, the right for you to have your uh, inaccurate data to be rectified or corrected. Um, similar, you have 30 days uh, to comply as a business owner. Uh, next is the, oh, sorry. Uh, I forgot, as I was traveling to uh, Montreal a month ago, uh, they actually had a law already on their books. They already have a federal law in place as part of their Privacy Act. And I was uh, on the plane and they gave me the customs form and it's, you, you know, right here it says, you know, the individuals have that right to make corrections of their personal information. So, um, you, you know, Canada's already ahead of um, us here stateside. California just passed the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, other states, are trying to pass civil legislation in Illinois, um, Colorado, I believe has one on the books. Um, so uh, my point being that it's inevitable, you, you know, so whatever you do, prepare for it now. GDPR has already, you know, set the standard. So uh, it's better that, that you meet these requirements now. Next is the right to object. Uh, the right to object essentially says that GDPR gives the individuals the right to object to the processing of their data. So um, say that uh, you don't want a company to be sending your data to a third party or a marketing company, you can actually request that and say, hey, I, I don't want you to be sending my data anywhere else. And so that's, this right gives you that ability to do so. Uh, another important one, the right to data portability. It essentially states that you can request your data from a company and it must be in a machine readable format. So they must give you all of your data. It can't be something that's, that's mailed to you. It must be in like a, a CSV file, an Excel file, a JSON file, something that you can take to another provider elsewhere um, if you want to do that. And in fact, uh, WordPress as a version 4.9.6 um, created additional GDPR tools uh, to allow you to easily export and import um, or erase a, a user's uh, personal data. And they've now, in fact, also allowed you to designate a privacy policy page um, that can be shown on login and registration pages. Another is the right to restrict processing. Um, say that uh, if, in fact, a, a customer um, is contesting data or inaccurate data on your website or on your uh, platform, um, they have the right to restrict the processing to be sent elsewhere, and that gives them this right. Um, another really important one, the one that's probably going to be the most used, is the right to be forgotten. And this allows for the ability to somebody to request uh, the erasure of all their data from your platform. So if, you know, I come to you and say, hey, I don't want my data on your site anymore, this, this gives me that right, and you as a business owner have 30 days to comply. And lastly, uh, it's the right to not be subject to automated processing. So uh, this is like, you know, when you're applying for a credit card, um, you, uh, you send in your application and usually within 60 seconds, a computer algorithm is making that decision for you and, and it comes back with a result. Well, with this right, um, it says that, you know, you can have your uh, application processed by a human. It's not going to be done by a computer algorithm. Now, I want you to remember to keep calm for, as you're learning all of this and, and prepare for GDPR and I wanted to give you a few tips on, on how you can prepare and do so. Uh, number one, perform a privacy impact assessment. It's essentially the, you know, the what, the why, and the how. What are you storing? How are you storing it? Why are you storing it? Uh, look at where you're holding your data. Is it locally? Is it on the cloud? Is it your hosting provider? Uh, what, what third parties are you using? Are you using MailChimp? Are you using SendGrid? Are you using Eye Contact? Uh, performing a security audit will actually give you a lot of these answers. And, um, and lastly, you know, update your privacy policy. And, and notify your clients.
Now, I want to share with you a few tips on how you can uh, protect your site from any sort of breach. Uh, number one is a, is a really simple one that not only protects you, but it protects your clients. Um, this is involving the transmission of data between you and your clients. So you want to make sure that you have SSL enabled on your website. Um, as of July, I think it was July 1st, Google Chrome started uh, labeling websites as not secure for those that don't have HTTPS enabled. So, and, and now there's a plugin that makes it really easy if you're not uh, already using SSL. It's called Really Simple SSL. So uh, first you want to make sure you have an SSL certificate from your hosting provider um, or any other um, certificate authority. You can, some hosting providers give it to you for free. Um, otherwise they, you know, you can get it for a small fee. And after you've got that installed, just install this plugin um, in your WordPress uh, site and it makes it super simple. It changes all HTTP links to HTTPS. Um, another tip, um, and this helps with a little bit of adding obfuscation. Um, you know, talk to your host. You know, look at keeping your database server separate. Um, this isn't you know a, a guaranteed safety feature, but it just adds another layer of obscurity, and and can help protect your site. Um, another important thing is you know look at your WP config file. Make sure you have restricted permissions on it because. Um, you know, this file contains all of the important information about your site. It contains your database username, your database password. Um, it essentially is a layout, uh, it offers a layout of how your website is, is where it's stored and how everything is made. So uh, make sure you have the, the proper permissions on that. Another one which I see really often, especially with developers, uh, people themselves, even hosting providers, um, and any sort of administrators, oftentimes they create a backup of somebody's website and they leave that backup file right in the public space of the website. And they'll name it, you know, backup.zip. So you could, you know, if somebody does that, you know, you might go to my website, say mysite.com, and hackers look for these files. They'll, they'll literally, they have a bot that searches for mysite.com slash backup.zip. So whatever you do, you know, make sure after you take that backup, make sure you remove it because it's, it's so common. Um, another thing I've seen, I had another client recently I saw who had done this, is they had their WP config file and they took a backup of it and they named it wpconfig.bak. And when you do that, um, bots also look for this. And so they can literally download your entire database set of credentials and they can read it in full text. So uh, make sure that you don't do this or if you do, just at least move it out of that public space. Next is, you know, protect your WP admin interface. You know, WordPress itself has a lot of um, good inherent security features, but this adds another layer of protection. It helps protect you from brute force attacks. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really good thing to add to your website. Another one is, you know, check your email header. So if you, if you ever receive, you know, a WordPress password reset request email, um, if, if the, even in your own daily life, personal life, you know, make sure that you're checking the email headers. My mom called me three months ago and she's like, hey, Sam, she's like, I got an email from the FBI. I'm like, mom, the FBI is not going to email you. So, you know, make sure that, you know, you check it, make sure it's coming from a legitimate domain. Um, next is huge, uh, enable two-factor authentication. So WordPress has, uh, there are some plugins you can use. They have a Google Authenticator plugin. Um, this protects you in the event that your password credentials, your login credentials are co compromised. So there are these breaches happening all the time across all sorts of companies across the globe. And if you have this, this will at least protect you. And what it does is it generates a random code on your phone um, and you can type that code in into your website. Um, there are also some hardware devices like a YubiKey uh, but both work uh, fairly well. And, you know, please do this for Gmail, Facebook, you know, do this for every website because it will really, really protect you. Um, a question I often get is, you know, do my plugins have to be GDPR compliant? And the answer is yes. If that plugin is storing any sort of data, you know, you have to make sure it's GDPR compliant and it's your responsibility uh, to ensure that that plugin can also export and delete user data if necessary. So. Um, if, if you're unsure, you know, contact your plugin author, make sure that it is compliant. Um, some really helpful plugins I wanted to share with you. Um, again, really simple SSL, the one that we discussed. Um, another one is WP Security Audit. It's a really great plugin that will 
keep a log of everything that's happened in your WP admin interface. Uh, if somebody creates an admin user, if a bot creates an admin user, uh, if somebody changes a password, it's all stored and the, plug, the, the plugin actually can even keep this data on a separate database server to make sure that um, it's isolated. Um, there are some other, uh, two other GDPR plugins and I'm sure there are there's several more out there now. Uh, one's called WP GDPR Compliance and there's another one called GDPR and some of these actually integrate with uh, like Contact Form 7 and several other plugins to make sure that um, your GDPR compliant on your contact forms as well. Now, CookieBot is a great website. Um, it makes it checks to see uh, use of your website cookies and ensure that your online tracking is compliant with GDPR. And uh, it's it's a great tool. So you insert your website. It's not foolproof. I've seen sites that are f fully compliant and this says that they're not compliant. But what it does is at least it gives you a breakdown of all the third parties or at least some of the third parties you're using. So if you, if you don't catch something, you can actually use this and you can see, hey, I'm using live chat. Hey, I'm using, you know, some other third party. And this may give you a, a list of those vendors that you're using. Now, what to do in the event of a data breach? Um, number one, you know, contact your host. Um, make sure that you download all your logs from them, save them. Uh, because oftentimes uh, hosts will uh, rotate their logs and they may only keep, uh, depending on the host, they may keep logs for a day, they may keep logs for a week, a month, um, six months. So you may want to check with them. You may want to check with them after this actually and, and see how long they are keeping the logs. Um, next, uh, you know, contact your third parties. You know, check with all your third party vendors, see what they're doing. Um, you know, and notify them if there is a, a breach and, and have a sort of plan of action in place. You know, know what your steps are, know what you're going to do. And should a breach ever occur and you've actually confirmed it, you have to notify your designated supervising authority by the EU and you have to do that within three days. And those powers, um, they oftentimes, they, they carry out audits on your website, they can issue warnings for non-compliance and they can issue corrective measures to be followed with, with certain deadlines. And, you know, they're not going to fine you that, you know, 20 million euros right away. You know, it's, it's obviously for the most severe cases, but, um, you know, but, but they do help, you know, keep things in check. And I'm assuming that slowly uh, over time, they're going to be enforcing this more and more. Now to recap on the, the data subject rights, I just wanted to review with them, with you, uh, with them really quick. Uh, number one, the right to be informed. Uh, the right to access, the right to rectification, the right to object, and we also have the right to data portability, the right to restrict processing, the right to be forgotten, and the right to not be subject to automated processing. Now, there are some unattended consequences when it comes to GDPR. A lot of people are saying, well, it's hindering innovation. You know, they're going to have to spend a lot more money now on attorneys, you know, spending hundreds of dollars an hour, and it's going to be really hard for startups, for small business owners, now that they have to be compliant with all of this. Um, a lot of people are also, you know, concerned about the blockchain. You know, the blockchain itself is immutable. It can't be edited. And, you know, people are storing all sorts of data now on the blockchain. And, you know, GDPR's, you know, right to erasure, right to be forgotten states that, you know, this data must be able to be erased. And so the blockchain obviously has a conflict with that. And so people are concerned about that. Uh, another is now with GDPR, I've seen companies just completely blocking the entire continent of Europe. They're just denying access. They're like, hey, you know, we don't want any European clients. We're just going to block that. And that is affecting their ad revenues. Um, so there's a lot of things concerned with that. Also, also the death of free services. You know, people are concerned, you know, that Gmail is going to go away or, you know, uh, Yahoo is going to go away or, you know, all sorts of these things. And, and so um, obviously, you know, it's a concern when it comes to data privacy. So th there are some things to think about when it comes to that. Now, I want to share a book with you that I highly recommend. It's called Data and Goliath. It's by Bruce Schneier. And if you haven't read it, um, I highly suggest you do so because it is extremely eye-opening, especially to those who may not be privy to IT cybersecurity. And I wanted to give you a few examples from the book and how it in fact relates to GDPR, and this is actually before GDPR was even enforced. Um, the author, Bruce Schneier, he describes to us, you know, the many unknowing ways that we co cooperate with surveillance. You know, for example, 
you know, like I mentioned before, our supermarket loyalty cards, they take our purchase data and they provide us with discounts. You know, we have free services like Facebook that take our data and then provide us with ads. And Schneier says that, you know, we cooperate with corporate surveillance because it promises us convenience. And we cooperate with government surveillance because it promises us protection. And the result is this mass surveillance society of our own making. And that's a direct quote from the author. Likewise, every morning when you wake up, you put your cell phone in your pocket, you're making an implicit bargain with your cell phone carrier. You're saying, you know, I want to be able to make and receive phone calls. And in exchange, I'm going to let this company know where I am at all times. And while that bargain isn't specified in any contract, it's inherent in how the system works. And GDPR today is changing that. Now, in summary, my takeaways are that I want you to remember that this is not just the EU. This applies you know, everywhere. This applies to the US. Um, as long as it's an EU citizen, it applies. And they are able to enforce this with long arm jurisdiction or extraterritoriality. And even if you don't have any EU clients, you, you may still be affected. You may still be taking in that data by way of a contact form, comments. Um, and again, uh, when people are submitting their data, you must obtain consent. Um, make sure that you, know, you don't have that, that box you know, pre-checked. And you have to be clear and concise with what you are telling your, uh, your users, your customers. And again, be prepared. Uh, start now. Be prepared now because this is inevitable. Um, I promise you there's going to be a law coming in the U.S., so um, get ready now. That's it. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions. Sure, go ahead, sir. So um, one of the things I've sort of been doing a lot of GDPR work on my own websites and things like that. I run, um, I run two WooCommerce websites, and obviously those collect cookies to do their work. Right. And um, I've been noticing as I've been going about the web that a lot of websites have these pop-ups at the bottom of their at the bottom of their screens that say this website uses cookies. Do you want to accept and continue to be able to use this website? Right. Yes or no. Is that something that is that a GDPR thing? And is that something that like I need to be worried about? It is a GDPR thing, and the question was is, you know, if they have a, a lot of websites now have these banners, should we be doing that as well because of GDPR? And my answer would be yes, if you are using cookies and you're accepting cookies, um, it would be advisable to do so. Um, I, I, and I think you can include in your, usually in that, uh, in that bar, it has a link to your privacy policy, and if people accept, um, you know, if they want, they can view that privacy policy and see where your, you know, who your third party integrators are. Um, so. I would say it is advisable, you know, if you have, um, if you're doing that. Um, is there a plugin for that? There is a plugin. Um, I, I know there is. But I'll have to get back to you on the name on that, but I, I know there are some plugins for that. Sure, go ahead. Um, when you're doing your privacy impact assessment, how far back should you go? I mean, how far back in my collection of information do I have to really offer up to you? Um, I mean, for your privacy impact assessment, you just kind of want to see, just assess, you know, for your own company or where you're storing your data, what you're doing with it, and then just disclose, you know, that type of information in your privacy policy. Um, if is your question related to what if the EU asks you? Yes, but I, I'm just kind of like how 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 far back into kind of the history of my site and my email and my retargeting ads do I need to? Um, that's a great question. Um, her question, I guess, would be to, to restate it: is how far does she have to go back to be, you know, to be safe um, for many, you know, EU requests? I, I would say, you know, be current as of right now. You know, make sure that you know at least you know who your uh, third parties are, who your vendors are that you're integrating with. Um, you know, you you may want to ask an attorney or a lawyer about that, but I would say, you know, as of now, you know, that would be, you know be sufficient if if. You know, if you're still storing data at a third party, you know, if, if you know you are, then, you know, and maybe you're not using them, you know, you want to obviously make sure that check with that vendor and make sure that all that data is gone and it's erased. Um, but that would be my advice. Sure, go ahead, sir. Um, 
It's a great question. Um, I believe Google has some sort of integrated tools to, to remove uh, personal data um, from their system. To, they're basically, they're, you know, GDPR compliant. Uh, but no, I don't think that that's in violation of GDPR, no. Sure, go ahead. Right, right, yeah, as long as you identify it's there and, and disclose it, but, um, right, but, you know, but it's not in violation. As long as you're disclosing everything in your privacy policy and, and, and you know, to your users that you're doing that, you'll be okay, but, um, but right. Correct. Yeah, you, you want to look at all your plugins and any third party that you're using and integrating with via live chat. Make sure that they are all you know GDPR compliant. And most you know large companies like Google, you know they, they should already have policies in place for that. Go ahead. Hey, Sam, so that plugin question about the cookie bar. Right. Easy enough. Thank you. So it's kind of a two-part question. Sure. So I, Right. The first question is, uh, what would you say you know, the first steps, or how, where do I start? Because I know that I should, like, they should do a full website uh, assessment and all the plugin, but for somebody who just gets this, it's like, I don't know. Right. I mean, it would depend upon the request. You know, say if somebody wants to erase their data. Um, you know, obviously, this would be a good um, way for them to get started yeah, um, into GDPR. The US for a website market, they even told, hey, let's, let's uh, shut down the customer. Right. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, they could, they could do that, you know, if they wanted to. I think, you know, similar steps, you know, just perform that assessment. You, you know, at least that will give them insight to how they're storing their data, what their infrastructure is like. Um, that's probably, I mean, they're going to need to do that. So, you know, if they get that first request, I would think that that's what they should be doing. And then once they do that, they can follow with a step of, you know, erasing the data or restricting the processing, whatever that request um, is. It is known. Um, it is very similar. So I know the right to um, erasure is there, but there's other restrictions in terms of um, some of it is not the same. I don't know if there is a right to restrict processing, um, but but there are uh, similar guidelines. It's, it is very GDPR like um, in and of itself. Sure, go ahead. Are there any online resources that are helpful in terms of uh, helping with uh, writing that privacy policy and the or whatever? Um, there are GDPR templates um, and websites you can use. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can um, I can Google it and we can discuss it after if you like. But I, I know there are. Maybe he can share something. And there, there is, uh, if, if for those who are interested in following GDPR, there is a, a, an attorney who I highly recommend just following online. She gives great advice. Her name's Lisa Hawk. She's with Everlaw. Um, she's on a podcast, uh, one of the Andreessen Horowitz podcasts. They're a venture capitalist uh, firm in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and that's Hawk with an E on the end. Um, she's really great. Um, she's been involved in a lot with GDPR, security, and compliance. Please, sir. United States started a lot of this long arm enforcement stuff by a drug policy, saying, well, we've got a law against uh, cocaine uh, use. So you could be 
in some other foreign country where something is legal and they're going to come and try to arrest you and bring you back to the United States. And now we see the EU doing the same thing with their privacy policy. So where do you see this going? I mean, how ridiculous can this get? Because who knows what some other country might pass and how, and, and how are they going to keep enforcing this? Uh, like, let's say it's a small country, like uh, Finland, I'm just going to make this Sure. What, what's your opinion on that? Can Finland make up a, a law that could affect everybody like this is affecting everyone? Sure. The EU is very powerful, but maybe other countries. That's a great question. Um, I would probably leave that up to a lawyer to discuss with you. But, you know, I would say, you, you know, it, the law is coming. You know, California's already passed a similar law, so you might as well be prepared when it comes to GDPR in terms of, you know, the rules on extraterritoriality and, and long-arm jurisdiction of other countries. I don't know if I'm as well versed in that. Um, but that would be in my advice. You know, maybe you want to consult with an attorney on that. Here we go. Three answers. <laughs> no. <laughs> Please go ahead. So, if you have contact form on your site, and your site is a few years old, is there any reason to, and I suppose you're storing the list of people who contacted you, is there a reason to, to contact those people to let them know how to sign retroactively that you're storing there? So, um, Yes. So, so similar, a lot of concern has come from mailing lists. So people who are already enrolled in a mailing list yeah. and the, a lot of the advice I've, you know, seen from attorneys and lawyers is that, you know, you can contact them again and ask them to re-opt into your mailing list. So that could be, you know, something you may want to do or specifically, you know, of your European clients, you may want to do that and look, look to see if you know which ones are in the EU, you can ask them to re-opt in. Um, so, you know, I would say that's the safest bet. Um, you know, it's up to you if you, if you wanted to do that or not. Okay. Let's see. Sure, go ahead, sir. Um, so, Brunson and some of my clients are on third-party platforms. Uh, for instance, uh, one of my clients is on a book-selling program associated with them, so not several, but uh, they are collecting information Okay, like Amazon and ABD books and others are collecting information from European customers, for instance, credit card information, um, you know, want lists of what they're looking for, all kinds of stuff. Now, some of that actually gets passed down the screen to uh, my client. Sure. So when you get an order from some company through Amazon or another platform, a lot of there's a lot of information that has been filtering down. You don't get the credit card number, but you might get other information. You could email address, get other information about what they're looking for, uh, comments, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, how liable are we for that when it's information coming from a major international platform? And what's our responsibility? I mean, are they going to come all the way down the chain of command to some guy in Silmar or something. Right. And demand a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. Well, that information is coming through email addresses and other, other stuff. Right. I would think that you are still liable in some respects. Most of the liability, I would assume, would be on that major international platform that's selling this product. Um, you know, it would. If somebody orders something to a from, from uh, Europe, they're going to send their their address. Right. So now you've got their name, their address, their email address, and maybe some other stuff. You don't have their credit card number, maybe, but is that something to be concerned about? I mean, I, I would be concerned about it because, you know, if that individual goes into that major company and requests their data to be erased, they should be contacting that vendor, contacting you directly to say, okay, this user requested that, you know, you now need to erase it from your platform. So. I would say you need to have those agreements in place. I mean, I know it's a headache, and that's one of the, the hurdles with GDPR. But um, yes, I would say you know you would yeah, be liable that, in that aspect. When they say erase from the platform, is that a lot of this has been printed out? Hey, there's, there's paper stuff. I mean, you know, not everything is just online. Like you get an order from Amazon, for instance, and you know you got to print out shipping labels, etc. In fact, most of those would print out 
the order the order itself, which would have a lot of other personal information that somebody from the airport say. Right. So now what are you supposed to do? Go back through your files and send them the shredded documents? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, I mean I think um, where are we at on that? You know, I think when it comes to certain things, I, I think you can redact certain elements of your order. Um, you, you know, I, I think it's probably best, you know, at the same time, you know, you ask your lawyer when it comes to specific things like this. But um, I, I know, like, there's a lot of forums, for example, where people are discussing things in a thread and a user, you know, requests their data to be erased, but that ruins the entire order, you know, of what people were discussing. And so similar maybe to how, you know, the orders work, um, people were saying, you know, they can just erase the strictly the, the personal information, but not the entire thing. So they'll redact certain elements of it. Um, but um, when it comes to that, yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you still have to, you're still responsible for, for erasing when it comes to uh, legitimate personal data. Um, so it's, it's something, you know, you'd, you'd want to discuss well, with yeah, the attorney. Amazon's going to relate, they could erase, I guess, all this, order uh, at some point, or not just Amazon, but there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of vendors that have information that they've already printed out. Right. So, I mean, how ridiculous is all this going to get? I mean, I think it can. I mean, I think people, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to understand there's going to be, you know, maybe some things, but... Um, you know, I think it's it's also to be determined. You know, the lo the law is just you know was enforced you know a few months back. Um, I, I think right now they're going to be you know enforcing this at you know all the major companies and and but it's slowly it's going to you know dwindle down to small business owners. But um, I think the total effect of it is is yet to be seen. Yeah, because I mean, can they come? Is some is somebody from the EU going to come knocking on your door and want to see your files in your garage <laughs> because you've got thousands and thousands of I mean, I don't think they're gonna come come that far, but um, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Once it's more stateside, then you may see more visible yeah. entities. Yeah. See Jerry Brown. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead, man. All right. I'm. I've been a blogger with the WordPress for a long time, so I have you know seven, eight hundred uh, email addresses from people who subscribe to my blog. It's kind of piggybacking off of what you said. I'm a little confused. I think I have a general idea what I need to do, like update my privacy policy, telling people what I collect, how I collect. Sure. But, you know, and I have seen those little cookie things, and do I need to add that? I, you know, it's like this all seems so overwhelming. To, you know, right. Just Blogging, it is. I mean, if you're not accepting any personal data and you're just blogging, you don't really have to do anything well, because. I am. I'm taking their email addresses, so I have their name and their email address. Right. Um, then if you if you have an email address or if you're taking their email addresses, you know, just be explicit on that contact form. Um, you know, you can have a small privacy policy page. I would recommend. You yes, know, and I do. and then. Uh, and edit it, yeah, and just say, you know, I'm storing your data on, you know, MailChimp or whoever you know, you're using. Um, you know, you're not, it doesn't sound like you're using any cookies. You can use that cookie bot website. Yes. It'll, it'll tell you uh, if, you're, if you're using anything. Um, but, um, I, I mean, I think you're, it sounds like you've got it well covered if you're just right. doing mailing lists. Well, but piggybacking on what she said, if I go back and, you know, some of these people subscribed to me five, six years ago, I'll never hear from them. You know, right. because I've gotten those emails from people and I'm like, I'm not, you know, read. Yeah, just right. I've got too many other things going on. So right. I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, no, I'm not using Mailchimp. I'm using a plugin through WordPress that sends out emails when I post. Okay. Yeah. We've got just a few more minutes for questions. Sure, go ahead. Uh, 
because they are in Italy, they're super knowledgeable about this stuff. And they have free seminars that you can just sign up for, and their developers and lawyers, and they're talking about exactly what you're talking about. And I'm not going to go on the record and say what it is that they say, but just put your mind a little bit at ease about the kind of overarching elements of the extraterritoriality and the small bloggers, and because people are out there asking the exact same questions. questions right. But just doing a Google search, the fear of God is insane. <laughs> <laughs> go to a reputable, watch all of these free seminars. It's not as scary as a lot of these sites make That's the I right. you meant that? Yeah. Like, and is it in Italian? It's not. It's <laughs> an excellent question. So, and if anybody has any questions, all of us. Sure. Do uh, you see uh, the, some similar you know, thing in the U.S. that's going to maybe conflict with some of these things from Europe? And do you see any kind of trend going where California or somebody's going to say, hey, we have our law, and we don't really care about your law because we've got our own privacy thing, and we're not going to enforce this. Your thing. We're going to enforce our own law first. I mean, there, there could be, um, you know, there very well could be stateside legislation that says, you know, uh, you know, you have to keep data for X amount of time and the EU law may say something that, you know, you have to erase it. So there could be some conflicts, um, you know, that's, you know, to be seen. Um, but right now, I, I think, you know, GDPR has set the bar and, and it's, you know, they've taken the lead. So it's better to, I would say, my recommendation would be to follow their guidelines. And then you know we can modify them as you know laws here in the U.S. make their ways. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.